Moving on to the next part of what we just talked about in class so far. Okay, we're lucky the first class was pretty engaged. It was good. Remember the emotional intelligence aspect of it. If you disagree with something, it's okay. Let's make sure you're listening and then listen to each other when they're talking. Okay, Miss Hinkle Jones's class is going to come in in just a second to fill in some of the other seats she teaches in African American literature classes in this period. She wanted to kind of Wait, hear what she said. Yes, yeah. and. Uh, so we're lucky. I'm going, to, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over. Um, Reverend Dr. Shannon Craig Snell is from Louisville Seminary. She's going to talk about a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in class and kind of put it in a different perspective from a historical standpoint. Okay. Thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Holine. I'm glad you be here. Thanks for letting me crash your class. I um, my, feel free to call me Shannon. And um, I'm hoping that you will ask lots of questions and push back in all sorts of ways. In your history classes, did any of you learn about Bacon's Rebellion? Bacon's Rebellion. Yes. So there's some yes and some no. So I missed this in my history class. I don't think it was ever taught to me in my history class. But in 1676, in the colony of Virginia, in Jamestown, there was a guy named Nathaniel Bacon. And he said, look, we've got rich European colonizers from England who are running the show. And then we've got poor indentured servants from all over Europe, some indentured servants from Africa, and enslaved Africans. And he said, and he said look, the poor folks from all different parts of the world have more in common with each other than with the wealthy British who are running the show. If we want to make things better for all of us, we need to band together. And so Nathaniel Bacon led a coalition of Europeans, poor Europeans, indentured Europeans, indentured African servants, and enslaved Africans. And they burned down the governor's house, and they took over. Now, it didn't last long because, of course, the Europeans said, hey, England, send us troops and money. That would be great. And they did. So this rebellion was violent and not pretty and not successful. The reason that I'm reminding you of it today is because it had a huge impact on what would become the United States of America. In response to Bacon's rebellion, those in power wanted to make sure that there would not be any more class-based alliances, that the poor people wouldn't get together and threaten the power structure anymore. And so they worked, wrote the word race into law for the first time in what would become the United States of America. And the word race was used in that law to enforce different kinds of segregation. It was used to make a dividing line between people of African descent and people of European descent, and to say, you guys can't, you can't be together. It included things like saying that um, people of African, African descent did not have recourse to the same courts if they were attacked, beaten, raped, killed by a white person. It included saying that African Amer Africans were no longer indentured servants, but now enslaved for their whole lives. These were the slave codes. And they were a huge part of what <laughs> became the structure of life in the United States. Welcome. You are welcome. Come on in.
Bacon's Rebellion and how in order to preserve the power of the wealthy British colonizers, the very concept of race was introduced into the law of the, of the American colonies in order to separate poor people, in order to make sure that poor people didn't band together to upturn, to, to overturn the power structure of the wealthy elite. Now the reason I'm telling you about something that happened in 1676 is because the pattern of separating in order to control has continued throughout American history. That the segregation of people of different, form, of different racial backgrounds is key to maintaining power as we have known it in the United States. Now, I'm going to redefine a couple of terms for you, and then we'll come back to segregation. We normally talk about racism as a, a person having ill feelings and saying something rude. That's ac actually called bigotry. If a person actually believes that white people are superior, they're a bigot. You guys have been talking about implicit bias. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I can't spell horizontally. Uh -oh. uh, vertically, I mean. When we have, when we see someone and immediately have judgments or ideas about how they might behave, that's called prejudice. And we all do it. If you haven't taken one of the online implicit bias <laughs> tests, you should totally do it. It's frightening, it's scary. We all imbibe the stereotypes of our culture in some way. Racism, in its technical term, refer, as a technical term, refers to a system, to the structures that maintain the power of some at the expense of others. All right, how many of you drive a car? How many of you ride in your parents' cars to get back and forth, or your uncles or sisters? How many of you ride a bike to get around? Awesome. How many of you walk to get to school or work or something like that? So very few of you get around Louisville any other way than a car, right? There are reasons for that. Part of the reasons for that is that our, our transportation, our public transportation system isn't very good. We have bike paths, but they're mostly in parks to help you like go have fun on a Saturday rather than to help you get to work and back. And basically, Louisville is a city built for cars. The United States as a country is built for white people. It was structured from the beginning to be for white people. And so if you're white, it's easier to get around. It's easier to get a job. It's easier to get an education because it's structured in the same way that Louisville is structured for cars. So it's not all about individual people's feelings. It's about the structures of the place. Does that make any sense? Some people are saying yes. So in the United States, the slave codes were part of that. Um, and there are lots of other ways that it has continued. You guys were talking more about segregation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the structures of segregation. Because now, we think, oh, segregation happened a long time ago. But much of America is more segregated now than it ever was. We're going to talk just a little bit about how that happens. So in the Great Depression, lots of people, no money, like seriously starving. You got lots of people in bad shape. So FDR introduces the New Deal. And it's a way to help people get back on their feet, right? It is, introduces 30-year mortgages. Before that, if you wanted to, so after the New Deal, if you wanted to buy a house that cost $100,000, which would have been way too expensive back then, you would put down $20,000 and pay the rest off over 30, 30 years. So it would make your uh, home payment about as much as a rent payment. Before that, you had to buy the whole house. Right? So a lot more people could be homeowners. Great. Home ownership is the largest wealth building mechanism in the United States. 
people who have money have money because they have homes. But those guys who created the New Deal, they were prejudiced. They didn't think about people of color. When they said, we want to help people get back on, our, on their feet, they were thinking about white people. Sure. And so those FDA-approved mortgages from the New Deal went to white people. Well, that was a long time ago. That's like in the 1930s. What does that have to do with us? Let's look at how it works out. So imagine you've got Mr. and Mrs. White, and they get a house. Over here, you've got Mr. and Mrs. Black, and they don't get a house. Then imagine they have kids. They've got three kids. They've got three kids. They, they're armless. They're, it's impressionistic. These people, the next generation doesn't even have bodies. And they get married, and they have more kids, and they have more kids. And you can imagine from your math class that a few generations later, you have an exponential effect, right? You with me? So what's the difference between having a home and not? In the United States, most people who buy a house get their down payment from their parents who gave them a mortgage, gave them the down payment for their mortgage out of their home equity. So if one person buys a house, they can then help their kids buy houses. They can then help their kids' kids buy houses. You with me? Is this making sense? So Mr. and Mrs. White now have a whole bunch of whites and they all have their own houses. Mr. and Mrs. Black have a whole bunch of kids, and they all have apartments. So houses and apartments aren't often in the same space, right? So there's a separation. And these kids and these kids don't know each other very well. And so they're afraid of each other. Also, if you are buying or selling drugs, if you've got marijuana in your private house, you're not going to get messed with. But if you're doing that, in an apartment building, you will. You're much more likely. Whites and blacks do drugs in the same, same percentage, and African Americans are much more likely to be um, arrested and incarcerated. Why? They're much more likely to be arrested because they're more likely to be handling drugs in an apartment mm -hmm. building or a public space rather than a private home. And then that apartment building is probably in a drug-free school zone because it's in a city. So then the charges for having marijuana, you just got two charges instead of one. Does that make sense? Whereas if you're out in the suburbs, it didn't happen that way. Yep? I don't think you know what you're trying to Thank you. Good. OK. I'm talking really fast to try and help you out. Okay, so imagine that my great-grandmother got a mortgage from the federal government that was intended to help people out. Good intention, all good. She helped her four kids get mortgages, and they helped their kids get mortgages. It means I live in a house. My friend, her great-grandmother was an African-American woman. And African-American women were not allowed, or men, were not given those mortgages. They weren't allowed. And so they didn't have the money to help their kids get houses, and they didn't have the money to have their grandkids get houses. And this is not helping at all. You were looking at me like this still doesn't make sense. <laughs> So this, you and I are saying the same thing. 
But what I'm saying is it could have been given to my great grandmother, and that effect doesn't dissipate over time. It instead it snowballs. It's a chain reaction that it gets increasingly more so over time. Even though the New Deal has been gone forever, there were decisions made in the 1930s that mean you have to work for it harder than I do. How are we doing? Pretty well. Yeah. Any better? <coughs> it's like I'm gonna do my hair now. Oh, salty as white people. Fair enough. So another decision that was made was if you when white when people of color were allowed to get mortgages, the banks had a a they had a pattern called redlining. So there were certain neighborhoods where whites could buy houses and certain neighborhoods where blacks could buy houses. And they were separated. And you could not change, you couldn't cross the line. So kind of like the ghetto that Hitler yeah, um, that was a more extreme version because they didn't get to own anything and there were armed guards. But we're still doing it and we're judging them for it, but why didn't we judge ourselves? Because we're doing it in a lower grade, but we're still doing it. Because America is home. All right. So what are the effects of segregation? What happens if you keep lower education and poverty? Lower education and poverty for people of color. Yes, people not understanding each other. People not understanding each other. Fear of differences. Fear of differences. We're afraid of what we don't know. That's a human principle. And then if you've got lots of things telling you to be afraid of the other. What else? What else? Think about Bacon's Rebellion. What's another effect of segregation? People aren't happy. If segregation means we don't organize well together. So if something happens to the, neighbor, the neighborhood over here, people in the neighborhood here don't even know about it. And we can't combine our efforts to change things. Does that make sense? And it's, it's a strategy. For the folks after Bacon's Rebellion, it was a conscious strategy. By the time you get to FDR and the New Deal, it wasn't conscious. These were good guys trying to help out. But they had imbibed the prejudice, so it didn't occur to them that they were they needed to help everybody out. And the effects of those decisions don't dissipate over time. It's a chain reaction that gets more and more and more over time. And we're living in the midst of that. And unless you're very rich, that system doesn't help even if you're white. Because it keeps all of us from making it a better economic place. All right. I think I finally have everybody's attention. I got excited, there were so many people in the room and I started talking really fast. So you guys have been talking about race and different things and your teacher asked me to tell you a little bit about my experiences in Ferguson. I, I live here in Louisville and when on August 9th, when Michael Brown was shot in the street, his body was left uncovered for four hours and 32 minutes in the middle of the street in Missouri in August. To the white people who watched that, it looks like inefficiency. Why don't they have an ambulance there yet? To many of the black people who watched that, it looked like lynching. For hundreds of years in the United States, part of how white supremacy was held in place was that over 4,000 men, women, and children who were black were killed outside of the regular patterns of legal resource. Someone said, oh, he whistled at a white woman, and so a group of people killed him. Someone said, oh, he walked on the wrong side of the street, so a group of people killed him. When lynchings happened, the body was left exposed, and the import of the body being left exposed was that it served as a warning to all other black people, don't step out of line or you will be killed. 
and no one will be held accountable for your death. So it's an extrajudicial killing. Does that term make sense? Mm -hmm. Outside of the courts. Someone gets killed outside of the courts. So for the African Americans who were, knew that history and saw Mike Brown's body laying exposed for that long, they said, that's a lynching. I didn't learn about lynchings growing up. I didn't know that history. So I just thought it was inefficient. The people in Ferguson knew that history. And so a lot of them, mostly folks your age or a little bit older, teenagers and people in their early 20s, went out to protest. And when they went out to protest, there was an enormous police presence that came back at them. And so every night, there were young people, teenagers, Millennials, young people, getting tear gas, getting attacked by rubber bullets, getting beaten. I'm a news junkie, so I'm watching this online. And I'm watching this on TV, and I'm thinking, these are, these are kids. This isn't right. <coughs> One morning, my 14-year-old son, he goes to Atherton High School. He came downstairs and he said, Mom, I think we need to go to Ferguson. I don't know how to help. What could I do? So I said, we're not going to Ferguson, I don't know what to help. Then there was, I was at a school meeting, sitting in the gym at Atherton, and I got a text from a friend who said, there's a clergy call to go to Ferguson. So um, I am an ordained minister, so it means I've got the costume and everything, I've got the stole and the collar. And the idea was, if we had people from different religious traditions walk with the protesters, the police would be less likely to harm them. It's a little harder to hit somebody if there's a preacher standing right there. You know, you've got a second a moment of thinking twice about it. And so we went. I drove and met up with other folks. We were supposed to meet at a grocery store in a shishi poo poo fancy neighborhood. <laughs> By the time we had four middle aged clergy people, all pudgy, kind of wearing sensible shoes. By the time there were four of us there, there were four police cars telling us we had to leave, that we could not assemble. Then we had a letter that we were going to take to the prosecutor's office saying, we want a special prosecutor to look into this. And a whole bunch of us, we walked through town, we all got our clergy costumes on, and all along the way, there are SWAT teams with guns trained on us and people in riot gear. We get to the prosecutor's office and we want to hand them the letter. And there are all these guards there and none of them would take the letter. So one guy un gets it out of the envelope so you can see it's like one piece of paper kind of wilting in the August humidity and handed it over. But they were so afraid that they didn't even want to take the letter. So that night we went and we met up with the teenagers who'd been protesting in the 20-somethings. They were meeting in a gym attached to a church and they had some supplies. They had um, swim goggles and little paper painter's masks to protect from tear gas. They had water bottles and milk to put in your eyes in case you were tear gas. And they were kind of worried about us. I mean, they looked at us and they said, y'all, you know, you don't really know what you're doing. And so they told us things. They said, don't reach for your phone. Don't reach for water. If you reach, they'll target you. And they, we wrote in Sharpie the police number, I mean, the lawyer's number on our arm to call for help. And we got in little groups and memorized each other's names. What's your name? Jared. So like I was, Jared's in my group. I'm not going to leave until Jared's out too. We're going to make an agreement. We're going to come out together. And then in those little groups, we talked about at what point do you leave? Do you leave when the tear gassing starts or do you wait for the rubber bullets? I'm a wimp. Why would I stay after they're tear gassing? And they said, the young people will stay. 
And if the young people stay, we need to be there to protect them. So we were singing as we walked up and down the street. We were singing, we shall overcome. And one of the lines is, I am not afraid. And I turned to the person next to me and said, that's a lie. I am afraid. <laughs> and we walked up and down the streets of Florissant, the Florissant in uh, Ferguson. And we were chanting things. We were chanting things like, no justice, no peace. Chanting things like, hands up, don't shoot. And people were really surprised there were clergy folks there. I said, wait, your church? Your church folks? And you could tell that our presence did make a difference um, on the police officers because they would say, we don't, we don't, we'd like to make an exception for you. I said, that's, that's the point. We don't want you to make an exception for us. As we walked up and down the street, there were a thousand or more officers with machine guns and the yellow twist ties that they use to instead of handcuffs when they've got a lot of people. And at that point in time, if you stopped for five seconds, it was called the five second rule, it has since been ruled unconstitutional. If you stopped for five, five seconds, they could arrest you. Or if you stepped off the sidewalk, they could arrest you. These things are unconstitutional. They violate the First Amendment. But they were being enforced. The level of military presence, I mean military grade weaponry, military grade presence, to suppress these young people said something real about just how invested we still are in the structures of racism and the separation that allows our power structures to remain as they have been. Now, I'm going to stop for a minute. I've thrown a bunch of information at you, and not all of it made sense. <laughs> so I'm going to stop and let you ask questions or make comments or tell me I'm full of crap. Talk to me for a minute. Yes, what's your name? Hi, I'm Jayla. Hi, Jayla. If there was an African-American clergy with you all, do you think you would have the same exceptions or the police would tell you? There were African-American clergy with us, and it's interesting. The clergy collar helps a little bit, but not that much. I mean, the fact that i white and the fact I have gray hair definitely helped. Yeah. It, it was safer for me than it was for my African-American clergy friends. What's your name? Lashayla. Did I just slaughter your last name? Say it one more time. Lashayla. Lashayla. Did Lashayla. I get it? Lashayla. Lashayla. Okay, my last name's Craig Ostell, so, you know, everything's easier than that. Uh, I know we go past and everybody don't want to talk about it, but I feel like so this election that we had just now showed everybody who's really a racist. The president, I understand everybody wants to do it about the president and stuff, but I feel like you can't tell me what I can accept if I feel like he's not going to give me what I need. Right. And so, yeah. I feel like he's a racist, a bigot, everything that's like, and actually I um, I talked to one of the, I'm ready to go to so I talked to one of the armory recruits and he said that they not, he's not president yet because they're trying to get rid of me. I just feel like you know I'm saying like the white people might have something good, they might have something going good for them with this election, but I know I'm not. So normally, in normal circumstances, the two candidates, it's like cherry pie and apple pie, right? They're both neither one is terrific. This is an extraordinary situation because uh, when Donald Trump was a candidate. Hey, when Donald Trump was a candidate, he said openly racist, misogynist, and xenophobic things. He has promised things like a Muslim registry, which is uh, fundamentally immoral and bigoted. He was endorsed by the KKK. He has talked about mass deportations of Latinos. So for me, I was like, well, let's wait a minute. Maybe he didn't mean all that. The first thing that he did was to say Steve Bannon yeah. is going to be his chief strategist. Steve Bannon 
is a leader of what is called the alt-right now. Alt-right is the new branding. It is the new branding for the neo-Nazi party. So let's be honest about that. That's what that is. And now people are talking about white nationalism. White nationalism, which is something that Steve Bannon endorses, is saying America should be a country, a nation for white people, and anyone who's not white shouldn't be here. That's what's called the KKK. So don't let the new branding fool you. Don't let the new branding fool you. There's a lot to be worried about. And I think that a lot of people who voted for Trump didn't quite get what they were doing. That's why he likes the uneducated. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? All right. Instead of chit chatting with each other, why don't you talk to me? Because that makes it easier for me, and I'm selfish. <laughs> Come on. What's your name? So, Flint, Michigan, it actually is related, right? It's that poor people don't count much, and Flint is a um, primarily, I mean, there's a lot of dark-skinned people living in Flint. So, we assume in the United States that our taxes are paid, and we will then have certain basic services, like roads that work, like clean water from our tap. People of Flint, Michigan were poisoned, and still do not have clean water, and instead of um, raising a huge outcry about this that changes things, we fussed about it for a little bit and then we're very quick to forget because we don't want to think about it. And this goes back to that basic principle of segregation. We are, we are been convinced that my fate is not tied to yours and your fate is not tied to the folks in play. But there is now a precedent in the United States for the... Um, for the government to provide poison water and get away with it. I am going to be your downer for the week. Yeah. And the other thing that sucks about our new president is that he has his court date on like December 13th or 16th, I can't remember which. which. And if he's found guilty, we can't impeach him because it was done before he ran for president and before he was declared president. So therefore, we can't do much about it. Yeah, if he's if he's found guilty, we can't well, impeach him because it was tried. She has to charge him. So she okay. You can't drop the charges. So our president elect is scary in many ways, and one of the things is that uh, the the sexual assault of, on women can't really be completely separated from the racism, because both of them have to do with the lack of of appreciation for the fundamental human dignity of others, right? These things are connected. So, do you guys live in a segregated reality? Yes. yes. Especially Louisville. Especially Louisville. Louisville is structured. The closest thing I have to a minority in my neighborhood. Do you want to know theoretically why? Yes. Hey guys, find out. Primarily, we're based on horses and bourbon, are we not, on our trades and our goods and services that we provide. Horses and bourbon, back in the day, were primarily white people who owned those kinds of things to produce those goods and services, but they had black people work for them. The white people now have money from horses and from that bourbon stock and are classified in Louisville as being the 1%. The and have more than normally taken over Louisville because that is our main export. So we have white people who have been privileged from the start, especially in this area, and have start, had segregated prior to this, and we're still segregated. They still put people in Section 8 housing and they are primarily black. So one of the 
one of the big things about, did we talk about redlining in this class or was that the last class? Oh, yeah, yeah. How do you keep straight if you do this most of the time today? So when, um, so I mentioned that the New Deal didn't support mortgages for people of color. It supported mortgages for white people, which effectively gave white people a 30-year jump on amassing wealth through home ownership. That's big, and that continues to grow instead of decline. The other thing that happened is when people of color were given mortgages, the banks did something called redlining meaning they determined, they drew a red line through the neighborhood and determined you have to live on this side and you have to live on that side. And that created really serious structural uh, segregation here in Louisville. Have you guys heard of Ann Braden? Yeah. Louisville hero. She and her husband, help me if I get this story wrong, purchased a house, they were white, they purchased a house in um, a white neighborhood and immediately sold it to African Americans. Savage. It was pretty savage, right? <laughs> um, so there was significant resistance, but it was a very, very hard road to hoe. And then in the 1970s, there was something called urban renewal that included building major highways and building them through the middle of cities that destroyed neighborhoods where people of color and white people had been more integrated. Which we have downtown. Right. So that happened in, in Louisville. That the, the, if, you want, if you look at the pattern of the highway, it destroys much of our chances for a racially integrated city. Yeah. That's nice. Okay. Did you that happened yesterday? Which thing? Where a neighbor sent a letter to... Yeah. So right now we have a rise in hate crimes all around the country, a rise in racist incidents, a rise in uh, anti-Muslim incidents. And part of this has been emboldened by Steve Bannon's place in the White House, by the, the election of Donald Trump. What do we do if we don't want that for our country? Yeah. And I looked at the election when I was watching after I voted. I looked at the election and I seen that Louisville and Lexington were the only Democratic city that I seen. And there, all the other ones blue. And I looked at that and we all like, Louisville comes together and Lexington, I, I live with, so they kind of come yep. together. Very recently, by Jerry Thomas. So, what were you going to say? What's your name? Uh, Chris, most Chris. of the big cities all around the country are democratic, and that's just what happens. Yes, Dem cities are, cities are much more likely to vote democratic. Um, cities are, why might that be? In freedom in the country. <laughs> all right, as a West Virginia hillbilly, I am not going to go there. Why might people in cities vote differently? Yes, what's your name? Bree. Yeah, oh, yeah. Because I feel like they're more open to what's going on around them. Like they're more aware. They're more aware. So there's a higher education possibility often in cities. And people live closer to one another. You're more likely to know someone of a different color. I was just going to say, like, their last question. What's your name? And can you speak up over the people who are talking over me? I was just gonna say the last thing you said about how people of color, like like every like people of different colors all live together like in the city. So you know it's like more like in like the rural areas, it's more like white people just own land. And everybody's segregated. Like there's a bunch of land between everybody. So you know it's just like you know everybody's section in like their own little space. So, right. Yeah. So if you actually get to know people across racial lines, mm -hmm. it changes how you think about them and how you feel. And so if you actually get to know people across racial lines, you're more likely to wish them well and less likely to be afraid. Kind of on something you said, you said that majority of the of black people don't live in the rural area, they live in the, in the cities. 92% um, of black people voted for Hillary. So that's probably another reason why all the cities were different. That's right, you have a higher, those two things are connected. You have a higher, uh, a higher population of non-white folks in cities. Yes. So it. Yep. Is that a hand up? Oh yeah. I was just gonna say, like, after what he said, with um, they feel different once they get to know us, because like since middle school, mostly advanced classes, which are 
Bunch of snow everywhere, and I have on a full snowsuit. Like, what else does it look like? I'm doing? well prepared for my crime of fashion, right? Ready. So we've got we've got stuff to do, and as we listen to one another in this uh, post-election era, one of the things that I want you to be attuned to is other people who are afraid. If your neighbors or friends or schoolmates or even someone you don't really know but you heard him talking in the hallway says that they're afraid, take that seriously. Because they are they see reality from a different place than you do and they have a truth to tell. So I went I went back to Ferguson later when there was another clergy call because they had been arresting these young people for stepping off the sidewalk for crossing a line. The police would say, don't cross this line. If you cross this line, we'll arrest you. Well, so a bunch of us who were clergy went back, and we said, we're going to be here with the young people who are protesting. So if you are going to arrest a young black man for stepping off the sidewalk, you have to arrest me as an older white lady with a clergy collar on, because we're going to make you we're going to try and make visible how ridiculous this is. And so I was arrested. What was I arrested for? Honest to goodness, crossing an imaginary line. I said, if you cross that line, we will arrest you. And so we crossed it. Because 
the way that we can survive and make this a better place with different structures is if we refuse to be separated from one another. If we refuse to imagine that what happens in Flint doesn't affect me. If we refuse to imagine that because someone else is afraid, that doesn't affect me. So every time that we can be together instead of apart, we are doing what Bacon's Rebellion did. We're saying we're not going to accept the separation you're using to keep in power. That's the most radical thing we can do. All right. Now that's all I needed to say. And you had your hand up. Do you believe that people being bigots are formed because you don't, you aren't educated enough? And if so, like, do you think that education is a right or a privilege? Because do you think that it's with us being further educated and being a right that we'd be less racist? Education helps. Reading novels helps. Being in community with people of different backgrounds helps. Um, I do, in the United States, uh, the right, having a good education up through grade 12 is a right. Um, we don't pull that off very well, and your teachers are carrying an incredible load and should get like all manner of chocolate, bourbon, and <laughs> The, you know, parties and better pay and more benefits. But um, we don't do that very well, in part because our schools are very racially segregated and poorer schools are less uh, well funded than schools in poorer neighborhoods are less well funded than schools in richer neighborhoods throughout much of the country. So, would it help? Yes. The United States school system started getting, uh, started kind of having more trouble after 1970. And this election, I think, shows us what can happen if you have a, an uneducated populace. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. So, as you get your news, I love that you guys are saying, did you hear about that? Did you read about that? These different things. I really want to encourage you to be aware of what's going on and to read the news, read the news, read the news, read the news, and don't read it on Facebook. I want you to read it on sites that are truth-telling, because, because the devil is a lie, because we do not want to get all this fake stuff. So I want you to read uh, from the Washington Post. You get 10 free articles a month, so you can read the headlines and then read 10 free articles a month. New York Times, 10 free articles a month. PBS has good, it has a movie called Erase the Power of an Illusion that is absolutely incredible. NPR, it's free, lots of good news on the website, podcast, 